What's up, bro? It's your boy, Mike Muse. Welcome to the Conversation with Mike Muse Show. I'm super excited to be with you today with my next guest. Uh, in my mind, I'm a complete tennis star. And by that, I took tennis lessons up 10 years ago for the summer. But I will say uh, my coach said that I had an awesome backhand, which I replied to him, I've already paid you for the summer. No need to butter me up anymore. <laughs> I'm sure you say this to all your clients. So ladies and gentlemen, I had the next best thing uh, is a former president and CEO of the United States Tennis Association, uh, Ms. Christina Adams. How are you, my friend? I'm wonderful. How are you? Good. And a tennis star and champion and pro yourself. I want to make sure I throw that in there too as well. Just a little bit of a light flex. No, I appreciate it. You know what? I think your backhand probably was good. So even though you'd already paid for it, it's, it's okay to get those compliments. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. But I actually do want to get back out there, like on the court and like hit some balls. And I actually did sign up for the service, but I might think you might be on a board for, I'm not quite sure. Is it, uh, it's called like play tennis, um, where you can sign up for lessons about the city. Yeah. Um, but and they, get you back out there and get on the court and get active. It's, it's, easy. yeah. Easy to yeah, do. I, and I legit did that before I knew I was going to interview you, right? Because I was like in my mind, so like I got my golf lessons going now. So I'm trying to get that back going. So like in my, I, I think it's the Olympics, Katrina, right? Like the Olympics make everybody feel like they're an athlete and bring out that inner athlete in them. <laughs> well, of course. And then of course Wimbledon's on, so you're watching that and you're thinking about tennis and getting back out there. And the U.S. <laughs> Open's coming up, so yeah, it's summer. It's a summer of sport. That's what it is. Now, how often do you get back out on the court and play? Mind you, it's like 90 something degrees right now, experiencing heat waves. I'm just curious. How often do you get but, back you know, out there? Fortunately, very, very little right now. I'm, I'm just, you know, I've got bad knees. I had one knee um, operated on in November and I need to get the other one, but I hit every now and then. I get out there with the kids. I have my um, Harlem Junior Tennis and Education program. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I feel like I'm playing when I'm watching them on the court. So, yeah. um, you know, through osmosis, I feel like I'm getting that work at it. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, you mentioned it before I could even is the U.S. Open. The U.S. Open is such an incredible an event. And I always had the pleasure. I've been thankful and lucky and privileged enough to have been able to attend the U.S. Open probably the last eight years, maybe like in a row. Um, it's something I look forward to. Uh, there is this the energy, not only just at the at the stadium, and the arena, but it's also to just in the city, right? Like, I feel like the city comes alive, right? When like the US Open is here in such a destination, I have a lot of friends who come in. Uh, I love it, my, my big baller friends get the sweets. <laughs> okay. Listen, we're excited to uh, to have the Open open again this year, uh, you know, with 100% capacity that's, that's scheduled to attend. You know, after last year when it was closed to no fans, it was a very eerie feeling walking around the grounds. I did some uh, commentary last year during the tournament. It was a very, very different feel, but um, everyone's excited to get that energy, get the fans back. The players will be thrilled to be back in that atmosphere as well. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Katrina is here for her new book that she has out. Uh, it's called Only Arena, Getting Ahead, Making a Difference, and Succeeding as the Only One. And so that is the point of reference I'm going to be talking about for this book. Uh, you know, I love when authors come and share with me their words and their books. Uh, I think it's really fantastic. Uh, but Katrina, I want to start this conversation off the way that you started uh, the book off. Uh, talk about the moment when Serena Williams played Osaka. Uh, I actually was there uh, in that moment when it happened. And so the fact that that's how your book opens up, I have you here now. What were you thinking like when you heard like those boos? It was such a very tense moment being inside the stadium. Um, and then in that, also too, in that moment, you kind of was a foreshadowing of like what is to become of Osaka, right? And the journey uh, that she had ahead. But as you being the president of, of the association, a woman of color uh, with two women of color on this court, like what was your thoughts as the leader? Yeah, well, when you read the book in the first chapter, you'll find out. But um, mm -hmm. in, a, in a nutshell, you know, it was a it was just a very different feeling for anybody in the tennis world to to experience and to be a part of. Um, you know, as, as I write in the book, I kind of missed what had really sparked on the first onset of booze. Um, I was trying to get down from my seat to the to the court in preparation for a potential ending of the match, but. Uh, at the end of the match in particular, which is what I experienced personally, uh, you know, it was a very, it was, it was, ear, it, it wasn't earring. It was, uh, I don't want to say it was scary, but it was shocking. Uh, it was shocking mm -hmm. to hear probably 20,000 fans booing 
um, you know, at the announcement of the United States Tennis uh, Open. And, and I think that was, you know, and it was right after that I had to speak. And, and so I felt horrible for the players, for Naomi in particular. Uh, mm-hmm. It's our first Grand Slam. Uh, it's our first U.S. Open. And, and you'll, you remember the first of the things yeah. that you do. And, and that memory will forever be, you know, etched in her mind, um, which is unfortunate. And, and you know, it's one of the things that I was, you know, trying to acknowledge uh, following the match of, of how thrilled I was for her, first of all. I mean, I, I watched her play in a WTA finals event in uh, Singapore and they had the Rising Stars. So it was the WTA Rising Stars event. They had like, I think six or eight of their Rising Stars that played the week before the finals, which are your top eight players. And mm-hmm. when I saw her playing then, I knew very little about her, but I knew that she, someday that she would be a star. And on that mm-hmm. particular day, she was the star. That star had risen, um, but it was it was overshadowed by you know all the other things that had happened in the match. So it's a uh, you know it's a moment that I'll never forget. And uh, you know I wanted to clarify a lot of the things that that occurred and that what my experiences were in the book so that we can all move on. Ladies and gentlemen, she is a great guest. She knows how to sell her book. She gives you just enough of a tease uh, to make sure you go to amazon.com to click on the book, Own the Arena, Getting Ahead, Making Difference, and Succeeding as the Only One. Katrina Adams is her name. Make sure you go check it out. So then, you know, audience, it's so interesting when you said that because I immediately thought, the VMA experience when Kanye uh, took the mic from Taylor when she was up for Best New Artist of the Year. Well, she had won Best Artist of the Year, Best New Artist of the Year. And when Beyonce came back and she won the award, her, the next category, she brought Taylor up and said, I remember my first. I think there's something about that moment of having your first moment with an asterisk such as that when someone turns on you or the crowd turns on you. And so that really made me think about that experience. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's also the reason, you know, one of the reasons why Serena stepped in and, and tried to calm, the, you know, get the crowd to settle down and and kind of behave, if you will, and and respect the champion, this new champion mm-hmm. who was so young, um, you know, and 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 experiencing this, and and uh, you know, it's it's you know, we can see where where Naomi is, is struggling today. Um, yeah. you know, and, and she does contribute some of that back to, to that experience that day. And, and I, listen, I get it. I was there. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't think I'll, I'll ever forget it myself. It's just yeah. a matter of how you handle it and move on. I'm a little bit older than she is. So yeah. I've dealt with it in, in a different way. Even just being in the crowd, being in a stadium, like the, the uncomfortability that I felt right? Like recognizing it was such a hard fought match for both of them, uh, recognizing the dynamic champion that is Serena. And I love how you said for Singapore as a rising star that was becoming Naomi Osaka, like, and to hear the audience boo like that was so real. But the moment that Serena stepped in, I mean, Serena didn't have my heart before, you know what I mean? Like she definitely had my, my heart then. Um, it was such a champion moment. Um, for her to do that. But I want to lean into that because your book talks about being the only one. And I'm just curious of thought because tennis, unlike any other sport, is such an individual sport, like literally an individual sport. It's just you, your opponent, the ball, and your rackets. And I've always felt dynamic that's in the head of a tennis player. It's so different. Talk to us about like even as you being the one in the arena, the importance of the self-care when it comes to tennis and the mental, because that has now become the headline news to Naomi. And I'm not asking you to insight, insert your opinion on any of that. So I'm just wondering about where the emphasis of self-care should be, in particular in an individualized sport uh, such as tennis. No, absolutely. And yeah, I can't comment on Naomi and yeah. what she's feeling or experiencing, but as, as a tennis player, you know, when you're battling, it is you. It's you against your opponent. You know, I think when you're training and you're and you're developing, it's more of a team because you're working with your coach, you're working with the other player on the court. You may be in a program, so you're working with the other kids um, to make sure that your your drills are going well. But when it comes time to competing, it is you. And and I think the life skills that we learn from the sport are what uh, what makes us uh, the champions that we are off the court today. Um, because mm-hmm. you're 
you're learning how to deal with adversity. You're learning how to build self self esteem and your and your self confidence. You're learning how to uh, develop tactics and and strategy because that's what tennis is all about. But it is a moment that it's also a space that is your safe haven, if you will, for a lot of individuals because that's where they can go be in that space for an hour, two hours, however long they're on the court and be themselves and let their true personality come out, whether it's a tiger waiting to come out or somebody that's just really passive and, you know, just kind of goes about their business, a little counter puncher that's going to be out there all day long. Um, and so our personalities come out, but once you leave that space, how are you dealing with yourself mentally um, and mm -hmm. physically for that matter? What are you doing to train yourself to stay in that in that arena of of that that safety net that you've developed, and and so a lot of players, you know, when they're out there, they're fierce, they're ferocious, they're everything that they aren't off the court, and trying to balance that and figure out who's who, and knowing when to bring that tiger out off the court or to tuck it in, um, is it, challenging, and it's and it's something that we're seeing more and more where a lot of these athletes are starting to struggle with that. So, Katrina, my audience knows I love to make things relatable for them. And as an audience, I know as much as we love watching Naomi and the Williams and Federer and all the greats play tennis, and we think that we are tennis players, we're actually not. <laughs> uh, but what you're saying is very applicable to, I believe, the moment that we're having right now of racial reckoning, identity, uh, and particularly when it comes to the workplace and the workforce, you know, we're coming off heated, you know, heavy conversations of social constructs about, you know, the professor from the UNC who didn't get tenure, now she's opting to go to an HBCU, and she's always been fighting to get into this exclusive space uh, and knocking on doors where she may not be wanted. And so many of us, and I've talked a lot of my, my, my listeners and supporters are having these same reckonings of their job, their corporate jobs, right? Fighting in a space where you're the, you're the only one. You know, your book, the key word in the title is the, only, is the one, right? We need the right. only one. Right. And you were the first black woman um, and the youngest to be the president and the CEO of the United States Association. And we all know tennis, I'm not here to get into that, is is, is seen as this very privileged elite uh, sport. The Williams sisters have talked very openly about that. Talk to us about your experience in this boardroom, you know, being the first black woman in terms of how you had to, to own your self care and presence of mind to go in to fight another day, to hit another ball, to serve. Yeah, I mean, on, on our board, I was not the first black um, woman. I was, uh, you know, what been very lucky with the USCA board is oh. that it's been very diverse. There's other boards that I've been on that I'm the only woman or I've been the only black that's in the room. So. Oh, um, my bad. I had the wrong data point. Sorry about that. You no, know, it's fine. It's just, it's just, you know, I've been on other boards where I'm the only one. I've been in other rooms and meetings where I'm the only one. I mean, I grew up in, you know, competing on the, on the junior circuit where I'd show up at tournaments and I'm the only one. So the only one references not just now, but throughout my life and other experiences that I've had in, in and outside of tennis. Um, but it is a situation of being confident in yourself. You know, if, if you're prepared going into a meeting, there's no reason why you should feel that you don't belong or that you can't stand up to other people's expectations. And so it's a matter of making sure that you are prepared when you go in the room. I talk about owning your voice. It's very important, important to own your voice. You're, in, you're invited to the table for a reason, right? So show up for the reason why you're invited. And that's, bef that's because mm. of your knowledge, your wisdom, your expertise, your experience, whatever that may be, your personality, whatever that is, you're invited for a reason. So make mm. sure when you show up to that table that you're prepared to be your best self for why you're invited. Part of that is owning your voice, not being afraid of, of speaking up and speaking out and sharing your ideas, you know, whether they're off the cuff or not. Because when you have diversity of thought, you're automatically going to say something and bring something different to the table than other people have ever heard before because they're not used to being in that space. And I think that's the advantage. I know that's the advantage that we have as individuals of color in particular, or as women, that when we are in that room, that we are bringing something, a different perspective to the conversation. So the only one for me is either being the only woman or the only person of color or only black person in the room um, on any given day. 
And more importantly, don't be afraid to own your identity. And I, and I think, you know, as we've learned in the last couple of years is that we are now owning our identity more. We're proud of who we are, where we come from, what, we, what we've experienced and how we can share those experiences with others as opposed to hiding behind our, our identity. And I think those are the two, you know, so two of the most important 12 points, 12 minute winning match points in my book. Um, and I would say the number one is, is owning your courage because you have to have the courage to speak up, to speak out in order to own everything else that is in your path for you to, to conquer. Yeah, I love how you started out a conversation. I, I've heard this saying a while ago, or reminded me of it when you were talking, and it said that when you're invited into a space, a place, um, and you don't speak up, uh, why are you even there, right? It's like you're holding a space that could have been for someone else who would have the courage to speak up and to say things. You outline this book really well, like in the sense of that the 12 steps is on the table, on your legacy, on your identity, on your choices, on your network, on your village, on your voice, on your success, on the losses, on your obligations and on the possibilities. That one stuck out to me. Um, can you talk about owning the possibilities? What do you mean by that, owning the possibilities? Well, the possibilities are endless if you put your heart and soul into what you're doing. So all the other things that you mentioned before getting to the possibilities, you don't know where that ship is going to land going forward. You may be, you may think that you're set, you're, you're not going anywhere. And, but because of your successes and what you've exemplified and how you've presented yourself, there's another possibility at another level that may come your way that you have mm -hmm. to be prepared for, whether you accept it or not. But the possibilities are endless in the space that you desire to be in. It's all about how you approach it. It's all about who you surround yourself with to open up those doors, to present those possibilities and opportunities. Possibilities are opportunities. And, and that's what I mean by it. I love that. I, I, I... Because you know, my audience knows I've been doing a lot of conversations about men not just self-care, but like the mental strongholds often that people put on themselves. Um, I've been talking a lot about children and, and I talk about, you know, sometimes in our parents or the origin of uh, the parents of this today talk about financial obligations to their young children. Um, sometimes always wanted to stifle their ability to dream, right? And to daydream, right? And to think about the possibilities. And so possibilities for me always rings true and strong every time I see that. I remember when I graduated high school, uh, when the school district administrators gave me the book um, by Dr. Seuss, All the Places You'll Go, right? And so I've always been very imaginative of self, uh, of like what I could do and what I could be. Um, and so I really just enjoyed when you said uh, possibilities. Um, your book is fantastic, audience. I highly recommend that you get it. Uh, but I don't have a lot of time with Katrina. But uh, Katrina, I have to be that cheesy host. And I hate to be that cheesy host, but I'm just going to be that cheesy host, right? So please forgive me. Um, do you have any Wimbledon predictions in the sense of like, you know, for the men's side and, and from the women's side? Well, I mean, it, you know, listen, Djokovic has been the player of the year to watch. Um, mm -hmm. He's playing with such confidence and such ease and, and such, you know, fluidity around the court. Um, you know, he's already won the first two legs of, of, of the majors. Uh, mm -hmm. Federer lost today. Uh, I know, I saw it, I couldn't believe that. And, you know, it, it would have been a long shot for him to win. We all wanted him to win, but we all yeah. know there's so many other players that are out there. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to stick with Djokovic right now. I mean, he's got a okay. tough opponent in Shapovalov um, in, in the semifinals, you know, young Canadian who's funky and, and on any given day can win a match because he's just that good. Um, yeah. I would say uh, Djokovic on the men's side. You know, on the women's side, I'm sticking with Ash Barty. Uh, she mm. is she is playing. Um, she's gotten better as a tournament has gone on. Mm. Uh, she has the game for grass. You know, she's got the huge serve. She's got solid returns. She can volley. She's got a slice that can really break up the momentum of her opponents, you know, even though they're big hitters that, that are there. But yeah. I will, uh, I'm going to go with with a party on the on the women's side. I love that. And the men's side, I do miss James Blake playing tennis, uh, which is kind of why I see him out there. For the U.S. Open, I'm not going to have you make any predictions, but I am predicting, I would love 
uh, to see Williams Osaka again in the finals. That would just be killer for the city of New York, for, for tennis, and just for the U.S. Open. Which, by the way, fun fact, I didn't know the U.S. Open, Katrina, is, and again, my data points clearly have been up to date so far, but <laughs> is the most viewed sporting event of, of all time annually. Is that, do I have that data point right? I think you do. I'm not in the boardroom right now to have those facts, but I mean, it's, okay. uh, everybody tunes in. And, you know, when you think about the hours that we, that are aired day and night, uh, you know, for two weeks, it's, uh, it's very possible that that is, that that is factual. That is insane. And cheers to you for being the, the CEO and president of that, all of that space. So congratulations. It was a good and, and an honor and, and hopefully, uh, you know, my, my legacy will live on. Uh, I think it has and it is. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you go to wherever your books are sold. Uh, for me, that's Amazon. No plug to Amazon specifically, but it's called Only Arena, Getting Ahead, Making a Difference, and Succeeding as the Only One, the incredible Katrina Adams. Thank you so much for coming on the Mike Mew Show, Katrina. Thanks for having me, Mike. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Had to have you back around U.S. Open time for more predictions. All right. <laughs> All right. Take care, Katrina. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.